Yes, you can. Make sure you check your seal. Because you're really tempting to her, because I'm in the area. Very dangerous. Any question? Not ICS, but I hope you how to wear the PPAPR. Today, the staff at the National University Hospital are learning how to use the powered air purifying respirator. It's an essential contraption to be used when they need to go into a zone with patients infected with contagious respiratory diseases. With the widespread COVID-19 infection, it's critical everyone in the team learns how to use it. While the world is stepping up its fight against the notorious COVID-19, there is another respiratory disease that has been spreading around for much longer and it has taken many more lives. I'm talking about the flu. According to the World Health Organization, the flu kills more than half a million people around the world every single year. That's more than 15 times the combined death toll from the SARS, MERS and COVID-19 outbreaks at the time of this production. In Singapore alone, the flu kills an estimated 600 people annually. In this episode, I tell you all you need to know about the flu and what are the chances of a flu epidemic happening right here at home in Singapore. We think we have the flu when we have a cough, fever and body aches. But do we know what flu is? A flu infection is caused by a group of viruses called influenza. Once the virus particles enter the body, they invade the cells lining the respiratory tract. The virus exploits the cell to make copies of itself, killing the cell in the process. That's when we start experiencing flu symptoms we're all so familiar with. Dr. Kelvin Goh is one of the 1,700 general practitioners in Singapore, the first line of defence for anyone suffering from flu-like symptoms. The majority of the patients who come in to see you, what is their diagnosis? About 35% of them are is common cold, and another 10-20% would be influenza or influenza-like illnesses. What are their reactions when you tell them that they have the flu? Quite nonchalant. Yeah. Oh, really? It's a uh, bread and bread about the stuff, They're normally not alarm. Do you think that Singaporeans in general underestimate influenza or the flu? Definitely. For example, 3 to 6% of people who suffered influenza would develop uh, pneumonia. So there's quite a significant risk to get seriously sick just from influenza infections. Just how complacent do people get? Some people go to work despite being unwell. They do not take adequate contact precautions. They don't wear masks when they're sick and sneezing or they share food and drinks and they spread the germs throughout their entire family. So it's not unusual to have one day the daddy coming in, the next day the mummy coming down with fever, and another two days later grandpa comes in with influenza again. The whole family gets sick. Yeah. Right. Actually the risk of mortality and morbidity is much higher than many other illnesses which they are worried about. Many people think of the flu as, well, just a flu. But just how serious can a flu infection get? January this year, American Katie Giovaniello, a regular high school student, had just celebrated her 16th birthday. Two days after the party, she wakes up feeling sick. She has a slight cough. Her mother, Colette, takes her to the local physician. She's diagnosed with influenza and given Tamiflu, an antiviral medication. Nothing to worry about, right? It's just a flu. I managed to track down her mother. It was about 11 o'clock at night and it was pouring rain out and it was really cold. I listened to her breath 
she was breathing. It was more like a shallow breathe, like a, because that was kind of respiratory. So I kept waking her up, are you okay, are you okay? And I kept feeling her and she was a little clammy, but she wasn't hot to where I felt an infection. About 6 a.m. or 6.20, and I woke her up and I said, come on, we have to go to the doctor. So I said, let me get you in the tub so you can, you know, just rinse off and then we're, we're going to the doctor. I sat her in the tub, I was with her. And she collapsed in my arms. She collapsed. And I, I didn't know what happened. I started screaming. And her sister came running in and started giving her CPR. And then they took her to the hospital and they put her on life support. What did the doctor say? They said it wasn't a heart attack. It was heart failure. It was like her body just gave out. She just collapsed. Five days after the onset of her flu symptoms, Katie, an otherwise healthy and active teenager, died. I was in shock. I couldn't understand how a flu could take her life. And I felt guilty. I felt like it was my fault. Like I, I, didn't, I did something wrong. I didn't catch it. I felt like I was neglected my daughter. It was hard for me to speak to Colette. As a mother, I cannot imagine what she must be going through, but it's a sobering reminder that the flu can hit anybody with devastating consequences. Katie isn't alone. As of 9th March 2020, the flu epidemic which ravaged the US claimed over 20,000 lives. It had hit the country unusually early this time, the earliest in 15 years. The number of flu cases that we're detecting is much higher than we would expect. We haven't had a bee predominant season since the 1992. What's more concerning is that this season's flu in the US has been especially deadly against children, with 136 pediatric deaths, the highest number at this point in 10 years. I'm concerned what's happening in the US could also happen in Singapore. We've heard of terms like swine flu and avian flu. I want to know exactly what are the differences between the various types of flu and how does flu kill? And I know just the person to break it down for me. Dr. Piotr Klebitsky has been treating infectious diseases for 20 years and was one of the medical personnel to battle through the SARS epidemic in Singapore in 2003. I have heard swine flu, H1N1, and then there's the avian flu. What's the difference between them? Swine flu was the name of the flu which we know now as H1N1. Initially, it was called like this because when it originated from Mexico, it was first discovered that it possibly came from pigs. So swine flu and H1N1 are exactly the same thing? Correct. This is the most common type of flu that we have in Singapore this season. Avian flu basically means bird flu. It may be surprised to some of us, but birds get influenza quite often. And the flu that infects birds and occasionally jumps to humans is called bird flu or avian flu. What about the common cold? What is the common cold? Common cold is most commonly due to viruses that are other than influenza. They are frequently much milder and they cause less severe symptoms. How does the flu kill someone? It actually can happen three ways. Number one, it can cause the inflammation of the lungs that will make a person so breathless that it may lead to death. Number two, especially in elderly people, it puts so much strain on other organs heart and kidneys and so on, that when they fail, that may cause death. And finally, the last way is the infection with influenza is opening the route for bacteria to move in. And this bacterial infection can cause deadly and severe disease. But what happens when the virus mutates? I'm about to find out how dangerous it can get. It's actually a whole different subtype of influenza. So that's when it spread like wildfire across the world.
For countries in the Northern Hemisphere, like the US and China, flu season typically peaks in the winter month of December. While for countries in the Southern Hemisphere, like Australia, the peak is in June. Now, while the seasonal flu cycle is somewhat predictable, what is less certain is when a variant of the virus called a pandemic flu will strike. When we are exposed to the flu virus, our body learns how to fight it off. So that next time we are attacked by the same flu again, our body is immediately able to recognize it and deploy countermeasures. But in the case of a pandemic flu, the virus emerges as a completely different strain. Since no one has been exposed to this new strain before, our bodies have no idea how to fight this disease. So not only can this new virus be deadlier, it is also able to spread faster. And here is the proof. The most severe pandemic flu in history happened in 1980. The Spanish flu was a pandemic influenza that killed an estimated 50 to 100 million people. That is the equivalent of the entire population of the US at that time. The deaths happened quickly within the span of 15 months. While it's called the Spanish flu, Experts believe it originated from the Shanxi province in China. It then spread to America and Europe through Chinese migrant laborers. In the aftermath of World War I, the disease then quickly spread to the rest of the world like wildfire. Singapore was affected too, with a death toll of over 3,000. Since then, there have been four flu pandemics, 1957, 1968, 1977, and most recently in 2009 with the outbreak of the H1N1 virus. Wow, that's more than 10 years ago. I want to know if we are headed for another flu pandemic soon. I've arranged to meet Professor Paul Tambaya, an infectious diseases expert at the National University Hospital. He has been tracking influenza activity in Singapore for the past 15 years and has been vocal about Singapore's vulnerability. So is it possible to predict when the next flu pandemic will happen? Well, a pandemic is quite different from the normal fluctuations of influenza. It's not just a strain, it's actually a whole different subtype of influenza. It's like uh, when we had the H1N1, when it first appeared, nobody had any immunity at all to the virus. And that's when it spread like wildfire across the world. Pandemics come completely out of the blue. They can't be predicted. Is Singapore particularly vulnerable to flu pandemics? Well, Singapore is particularly exposed to flu pandemics because we're a major trade and transport hub. We're one of the world's busiest airports, the world's busiest seaports, and so we have millions of people passing through our sea and land and air borders every day. An illustration of this is the fact that even with seasonal flu, uh, we have two peaks. We have a peak in May-June and we have another peak in December. And these peaks probably correlate more with the school holidays. When people in May and June, they bring home the flu from Australia and New Zealand. And in November or December, they bring it back from Korea, Japan or, or other temperate countries. So we are sandwiched in between the northern and the southern hemispheres so with a double whammy. That's the correct. North. That's unfortunately the case. The good thing about the influenza is that the experts have been studying the disease for a really long time and the proof is in the flu vaccine. The problem is, not enough people in Singapore are getting the flu shot. Professor Clarence Tam is trying to convince the authorities that the flu jab should be given to all primary and secondary school students. Why aren't Singaporeans getting our flu shots? So one common misconception is that the flu is something that you get the vaccine against when you travel overseas. So many parents have traveled abroad and they've been recommended by their GP to, to take the flu vaccine. And so they associate the flu as being a disease that you have to worry about when you travel overseas. Whereas in fact, we see a lot of flu in, in Singapore. I find the idea of vaccinating children who are attending say primary schools and secondary schools quite interesting. So that's something that in public health we call herd immunity. 
the idea is that if you have a sufficiently large proportion of the population that is protected by vaccination, then even if you have other people in the community that are not protected, they are less likely to be infected because most of the people around them can't actually get the flu. And we know that a lot of the transmission of the flu virus happens uh, in children. How feasible is it to give our school children, for example, the flu vaccine? It obviously has resource implications because this needs to be done on a very large scale and it has to be done every year. But since the influenza virus has a nasty habit of mutating, it's a race against time for vaccines to keep up. But what about these? The apple garlic onion. Why? Natural ingredients. Lemon juice. Vitamin C. Could these remedies be the solution to all our flu problems? I'm on a mission to find out how dangerous influenza can be. And I've discovered that one way to fight it is to build our defences with the vaccine. Our natural defences are not always perfect. When new threats present themselves, we may struggle to keep up. And sometimes all we need is a little help. A flu shot is all it takes to teach our bodies how to respond to certain flu attacks and what defences to deploy. Enabling us to overcome the invader. Current vaccines target only known strains. So if you catch a virus that has mutated, essentially the flu shot could be useless. I want to know why our vaccines can't keep up with flu mutations. So I've arranged to meet Dr. Yvonne Chan. She has spent the past five years studying flu vaccines. We do have to understand that there can be certain mutations. Let me just show you using these, for example, over time, there can be certain small changes on the surface of the flu virus um, which actually make it slightly different from the vaccine strains. So these small changes are what we call antigenic drift. So when your body is faced with this certain uh, flu virus, you may not actually have the immunity um, to fight it off and you still get infected uh, by the flu virus. How long does it take for this drift to happen? It's difficult to say for sure. That's why there are actually experts around the world keeping a close eye on influenza activity, surveillance data, to help to predict each season which type of vaccines, uh, which type of virus strains should be included in the vaccines. However, there is another phenomenon where it's a bit more drastic, where actually there can be major changes on the surface of the flu uh, virus itself. So it changes to something that is completely different and is what we call antigenic shift. Once that influenza strain is present, there is a chance that it can lead to infections in large uh, groups of people they're causing a pandemic. Since the pandemic flu is spread by a virus that is so different from what has been observed previously, not only is it able to bypass our natural defences, it is also able to bypass the defences set up by the flu vaccines. Given the protection levels, would you advise me to go for the flu vaccine? So typically the level of protection is 40 to 60% for each season and actually this affords quite substantial protection um, for a person. So I would say yes, you should still go for your flu vaccination. Your flu shot is like wearing a bike helmet. You hope you don't ever have to use it. But when you do, Sometimes it protects you completely. Sometimes not so much. As in the case of when the flu virus has mutated. But you're almost always better off with it. But if it happens that we come down with the flu, I want to know if any of the common remedies we go to actually work. 
These are some remedy for flu, lemon juice, apple, garlic and onion, vitamin C, antibiotics and flu tablet. Have you ever tried any of these? The cold and flu tablet. And did it make you feel better? Yeah, the vitamin C. It's like supposed to boost your immunity. Do you think that you recovered faster with the cold and flu tablets? Yeah, I think. Which one of these do yeah. you think will help you to get better? The apple, garlic, onion. Why? Natural ingredients. Um, choke a load of antioxidants. Antibiotics. Did it make you feel better? It worked quite well on me. Your vitamin C. Oh, I just have that notion. Lemon juice. Vitamin C. After you take it for some time, you will heal better. Well, it seems like most people believed vitamin C and flu tablets would fight a viral infection. It's time for me to find out if those beliefs are well founded. I'm back with Dr. Chan. So my big question is, do these work? With regards to cold and flu tablets, which are commonly found over the counters, um, they may contain certain medications that actually help a person to feel better. For example, paracetamol can help uh, to lower the fever, you may feel better. Certain medications contain decongestions, which may help with like a blocked nose. But in effect, it actually doesn't kill the flu virus and it doesn't alter the cause of the infection. Okay, now, antibiotics. This one I'm really interested. Can they help with the flu? So we must understand that the flu is actually caused by a virus and antibiotics are actually agents that kill bacteria. So in essence, it does not help with the flu. What about this one? Vitamin C. It's very, very popular. Does it help for the flu? So vitamin C doesn't work directly on the flu. There is no like large-scale proven reports or case studies or large trials to show that it will fight the flu. This one uh, is interesting. It, it might actually make a very, very yummy soup stock, I tell you. The onion, the garlic and the apple. Will it work? So there may be substances in these that may potentially help with your immune system. It may make you feel better, but it's not going to kill the flu virus itself. So people are probably soothed by it. Yes. And finally, the lemon water. I noticed that this is very commonly practiced, even when people are well. Uh, I see friends and colleagues sometimes with these giant tumblers of water and they've got one lemon inside. Does this work? Lemon does contain uh, vitamin C and that may be a reason why people actually use uh, lemon juice or they uh, make lemon water to drink. But um, in a similar vein with uh, vitamin C tablets or other medications to make them feel better, it doesn't actually kill the flu virus. Turns out, these remedies will only give you some comfort while your body is the one fighting the infection. So is the flu dangerous? Yes, for a good number of people. And it's really a pity because vaccines are already available. The vaccines don't just protect you, but also the people around you. And as I've learned, no one is really safe from a pandemic flu, which is why we should not underestimate the disease.